Welcome to the Home Group Podcast, where we discuss everything addiction, recovery, mental health. I am Flip. And I am Luke. Our generation of men, you're not allowed to have feelings. We're going to talk about things that are uncomfortable, things that are scary, because when you talk about it, you take away its power. The only thing that's going to keep me clean is me not wanting to be who I was then. Uh, we was in the trenches, now look how we out here balling. Popped up in the max, now we flooring in the fall. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Home Group Podcast. I am Flip, clean date, April Fool's. 2016. Oh. <laughs> clean, real clean. You know what I mean? Real clean, boy. And yes, I sir. am Luke. Clean date, October 11th, 2017. I did not bring anything. Yes, you I got, got me. You I got, got him. Yes. First time you got me. God bless. <laughs> that felt good. <clears throat> that felt good. Um, I am super pumped about our guest today. Mm. And I actually asked if I could introduce him, even though you're the one that brought him on. Yeah. So um, that's what I do. I bring, you know, I put people on for the city. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Um, So (laughs) this is a good friend of mine. This is Andy. I have known Andy since really the beginning of my recovery journey. Uh, He was one of the first people that I met in the rooms. And one thing that I really admired early in my recovery was his ability to go into a meeting and just keep it a hundred percent funky. Mm. He would, he has no problem telling everybody exactly where he's at. And that was something for somebody new in recovery who was afraid to talk in front of people, didn't want to tell anybody if I was struggling. And then you see this, you know, big brolic dude, you know, scary looking dude, like, yo, I'm struggling. Mm. And it was one of those things that, um, I just gravitated towards, you know, one of my first real struggles in recovery, I was going through a situation with a chick, ironically, your brother too. Um, (laughs) And your brother was just getting out of jail and I heard he was going to be at this meeting. Right. Yeah. And so I was going to eat his face. Yeah, of course. And um, I'm calling people. I can't get through to anybody. And I go to this meeting, and this was uh, the old Church of the Cross meeting. There used to be 100 people there, right? And I'm sitting there, and my foot's going 100 miles a minute, right? And I see him walk in, and I just feel the blood rush, right? And the meeting opens up, and they open it up with a burning desire. And Andy raises his hand. He said, sometimes I just want to fucking fight people. Yeah. I just want to just knock people's heads off. Yeah. And I don't know why. Yeah. Right? And he just, he spieled for about five minutes about trying to deal with anger in recovery. Because it, it's it's one of those tough things that you try to navigate, especially in early recovery. You're trying to manage your emotions and keep everything in check. And about halfway through the meeting, he got up to go to the bathroom. And I ran in the hallway and I was like, yo, and I told him the whole thing. He said, listen, you're allowed to feel that way. He said, the difference is you don't have to do anything about Mm. it. You don't have to act on it. Mm. And that was my first introduction to Mr. Andy Vance. So thank you for being here, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. The man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The legend with the worst luck (laughs) in the world. We're going to get into your uh, 2023 and how that was your fucking low light reel of 2023. Boy, God bless. (laughs) Oh my God, dude. You flip a coin and it lands on purple. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how does that happen, y'all? God bless, boy. All right, Andy, I'd like to uh, start this off by maybe if you if you could just get into like a little bit of like your early, um, your upbringing, maybe. Can we do that? Yeah, as long as you talk talking to Mike, we can do whatever. Let him ride out. I've yeah. been talking in the mic. Yep. Mm-hmm. I've been talking in the mic my whole life. Yeah. You might as well call me Mike. You feel me? Oh, God. Mike. God, is Mike. 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 <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, let's get started. My name's Andy, um, mm. and my clean date is March 25th of 2020. Ooh-wee. So, I'll be coming up on four years here real shortly. Um, and just a little background. So, the most time I've ever had in recovery was 46 months. Um, and for a long time, I lied and said I had four years. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I wanted so bad to get that four years. <laughs> and never actually got it. Um, but now that I'm so close to it, man, it's uh, it's it's unbelievable that, um, that I'm even 
going to be able to say that I did for real pick up four years this time, you know. Um, but a little bit of my upbringing, man, I was from New Jersey. That's where I'm originally from. You know, uh, I don't know if anybody on here has ever been to New Jersey, but it sucks. It, it's the slums, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've um, heard. So we grew up real poor in the slums of New Jersey. We didn't have much. My mom raised four kids all by herself. Um, you know, I didn't really get to see my mom that often. I got uh, two older siblings. I got an older sister. You know, rest her soul. She's no longer with us. Um, and I have an older brother and then a younger brother. So I was like the middle child. Um, and growing up up there, man, was rough. I remember being like the only white people for miles, dude. Like I think the high school we went to or the school that we went to, middle school, was like 98% black. There was mm. like... And up, up north's a lot different than schools down here. Way different. Right? So, like, everything's inside. Yeah. Like, when I came down here and I was like, well, you get to walk outside to go to your other class, like, <laughs> outside, outside. I'm like, that's not like it is up there. Everything's inside. You know what I mean? Um, and it was just wild, man, growing up like that. Because I think at one point there was, like, 1,800 or 2,000 people in school. And, like, there's only six of us that were white. So it was, Sheesh. It was pretty... Just sprinkled, mm -hmm. we were definitely sprinkled in minority. into the crowd. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was hard, man. It was a street life. Like, you know, I was young. At a young age, I started doing real dumb stuff. You know, um, stealing and all kinds of stuff, man. Except my older cousin's named Willie Jim. He was, uh, he was real big in the drug game, standing on the corner doing that type of stuff. So I always thought that that type of lifestyle was real cool, you know. Um, and then... Like, I even break it down a little bit more because I'm not scared to talk about what happens in my life today because, you know, I'm transparent with people in my mm. life today. And I can be transparent on the home podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? So at a really young age, I started to get molested, man. And, it, like, for a long time, for about a 10-year period, and it was, like, not just something that happened every other day or, you know, something that happened once a week. This was something that happened on a daily basis maybe a few times a day. God. Right? And it and it was at a young age when that started to happen. I was probably around five, right? Um, and it really messed me up, man. Like really, really messed me up in the head. Cause and like I shared my story last year or last week at this meeting, um, and like I didn't know if it was right or if it was wrong or what the case maybe was at that time. But it was just wild that what was going on. Um, so I just completely like if I mean if I could be honest, I became I think insane. Right. At some point in time in, in that whole situation. And I just started doing crazy stuff, man. Like I didn't care about anything. Um, all I knew is that I didn't want to go home. <laughs> right. Because I knew my mom wasn't there because she worked. Um, she worked three jobs, man. So we seen my mom maybe about an hour out of the day. Like she come home at like five to six to like try to throw something together to make us to eat. Um, and then she, we wouldn't see her again for a long time. So I was like five, six, seven years old running the streets, man, like in a big city Damn. where people were getting shot. Like, you know, people were stealing cars and I'm running around on the corner like a little kid. But this was um, and it's wild to me now because I have three of my own children and to imagine them doing the stuff that I was doing when I was their age. They're like, the age now that you were two of them right when yep. you were running around yeah man and it's wild to even to even fathom the situation but um you know another messed up situation was with my pops man like i seen him a few times you know what i mean and the only really time i ever remember seeing him is like when he was beating the crap out of my mom right and uh every nobody could tell me that he was doing anything wrong you know what i mean and i couldn't fathom as a young kid that like he decided to drink and drug over instead of being with us, right? And that just like blew my mind as I was growing up. Like, how could you do that? Um, and come to find out, you know, later in life, I did the exact same thing mm. because the disease of addiction is that strong, mm. right? And you know, some people that listen to this podcast or even know, or might know that that's how powerful this disease is, right? So it was very powerful in my life at a young age, man. The first drug I ever did, like, I, if I could be honest about that, too, like, we were, I think, maybe seven, and uh, I walk into my house, and, like, nobody's ever there, right? And my whole house smells like air freshener. 
I'm like, what the hell is going on right now? No. Dude? I'm like seven and me and my buddies walk in, you know what I mean? <laughs> and like, so I go upstairs into my brother's room, which was the attic, because up up north, you got a basement, then you got the regular floor, then you got the third floor, then you got an attic. So they're like big houses, man. Love an um, attic. Yeah, so I go up oh. there and the whole room's just smoked out. Him and his buddies are up there huffing air freshener, right? So <laughs> yeah. put a towel over it and spray it into the towel, then you huff it. And then it's kind of like whippets when you let it out. It's like boom, 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 boom. The white wizard. Bro, it was wild. That's so, what they call it in the Seven streets. years old. Seven. God. Yeah, man. So I remember, um, I remember that and then I remember doing it like... Me and my homeboys were hooked, dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so up north, like down here, they got like quick stops and stuff like that. Up north where I come from, it was called Krausers, right? So I remember us being behind Krausers. We go into Krausers and steal about four or five cans, you know what I mean? And if one of us take our shirt off and we're just all messed up. Huff. Second grade. Yeah, man. It, yeah, <laughs> like for real, seventh grade. Yeah. Um. So, and then like, you know, there was just a lot of – um. A lot of chaos going on, man. And then, you know, at a real young age as well, I found sports, man. And that was kind of like an outlet for me. Um, you know, I started to wrestle and I started to play basketball. And, um, you know, but in that whole time that all this is going on, like my dad, you know, I really don't see my mom too often. Nobody's really around, you know, because my oldest brother's five years older than me. So, you know, if I'm seven, he's 12, 13, you know, he's out running the streets doing his own thing a lot. Um, I'm left all alone to my own. And, you know, we were just out there. And I had a couple buddies, man. We were doing crazy stuff. Like, you know, eight or nine, we're stealing cars. Um, you know. You know what's doing- crazy to think about is, like, and I, pre- I appreciate, you know what I mean, like, having to go through that. And I can't imagine that. But what I also can't imagine is, like, the ages that you're saying. Like, you're, like, 12 and 13. He was out there running the streets. You know what I mean? And, like, you were running the streets at, like, six and seven. Like, Six and seven, I was walking to and from the bus stop. You know what right. I mean? Like that. Like that was. Yeah, that's my daughter's age, bro. Yeah, right. She spelled shit on the tablet the other day, and I almost lost my mind. Yeah, absolutely. She spelled yeah. the word shit, and she tried to keep it from me. And like, it was like <laughs> a big thing it. in my. Yeah, dude. She Not was like, I, did, I don't want to. Sh- I don't want to show you. You're gonna be upset. I was like, just spell it for me. She was like, S H I T. I was like, <gasps> you know what I mean? Because I could. I can't fathom her being like a bad kid but you're out so, there yeah you know I mean? it was wild so what's crazy about that is like you're saying that your daughter was like you know writing that type of stuff on a tablet when we were that age so what was real funny you're talking about walking to the bus stop yeah i remember going to the bus station like where they used to park all the buses at <laughs> and me and my homeboys were in there popping the tires dude. so the bus can't come pick us up the next morning like you know what i mean that's what we were doing um because we hated going to school um, what and, a long con, dude. <laughs> what, what a twist. But it, hey, that's real life, like, though. Fuck. This is really the stuff that we used to do. Um, Ocean's was, 11, dog. Yeah, it was wild, man, because we didn't want to go to school. We figured if we popped the tires on the bus you know, yeah, in the morning, they can't come course. pick us up, right? They were there, did, it, did it ever work? Yeah, it worked a couple times. Dang. It worked a couple times. Yeah, because we found out what bus was ours, like what number bus came yeah. down our road. Yeah. And, you know, that's the one we used to go to. Bro, oh, you were like the elementary Robin Hood, dog. Yeah. Like. And you know what's crazy, even more crazy, is that my mom and my aunt, which was my mom's sister, were bus drivers. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> so, like, yeah, Bro. it's wild, dude. Dang. It's wild. But, um, so, uh, yeah, man, it just um, accumulated into, and then like all, like I said, all this time and all this stuff's going on. Like I really, like the m- couple other times I remember seeing my dad, like I remember seeing my dad, I maybe, I was around nine, um, and I used to see him periodically. Like I'd walk or be driving down the street or in my mom's car or something, and I'd see him on the corner like all drunk and shit. Like that's really too many times I haven't seen him. And, uh, you know, the cops hated him. Um and they always used to pull, like, the cops would pull me and my brother over and say, ah, you guys are scumbags because your fences. You're, you're going to be just like your dad and da-da-da-da-da. And I remember one time them hopping out the car and beating my brother up. Like, the cops literally beat my brother up just because he was my dad's son. And I was young. You know, I'm trying to do something, like kick him in the leg or something. Yeah, you know of I mean? course. Um, like, I'm like, trying to fight here. something. You're going to leave here yeah. missing a toe or something. <laughs> yeah, dog, I'm like. getting something, you know what I mean? Yeah, did that but, uh, make you, like uh... – almost like mold you into wanting to be like live up to that absolutely yeah man and that's another thing like uh 
like I felt like I had this expectation I needed to live up to because, you know, where we came from, I get I guess like I don't really know. I just know from what people told me is that like my dad was one of the baddest dudes ever walked that neighborhood. Mm. Right. Like if anybody messed with Jimmy Vance, like they he supposedly was badass. Right. So and then growing up, Jimmy, my brother. Bro, people were scared of him. If I just told him he was my brother, he'd be like, hey, we don't want nothing to do with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely an expectation I felt like I needed to live up to. And then trying to be that strong man that I wanted to act like I was just as hard as my dad and my brother. But behind closed doors, I'm getting molested. So I really feel like I don't even know if this is me. You know what I mean? Am I even that strong dude? Or am I a pussy because this is what's going on? So this is all the stuff that's, like, going on in my head, right? Um and as I'm growing up, like all this stuff is happening, man, it was just wild. And it really turned me into something that um, was a complete maniac, man. Like I just didn't care about anything in life. Uh, you know, at a young age in school, I threw a desk at a teacher and broke eight of her ribs and got expelled from school. <laughs> and then they brought me to another school and I got in a fight with the principal and beat up the principal. Not like beat him up, but I was swinging on him and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got expelled from, like, every school in the state, almost. And they put me in this school, and my brothers, my little brother and my older brother, they laugh about it because, uh, well, now we can laugh, but, like, there were bars on the windows and shit. Yeah. Like, it was, like, a super bad school. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, so all that was happening, man, and I just, um, you know, I just didn't have anybody that looked over me, like, to say, hey, this is the wrong thing to do, this is the right thing to do. So I just went with what I thought was right, which was robbing, stealing, doing whatever to get by at a young age, man. And it's so wild. Yeah, right? no, I can't I can't imagine I can't imagine just being alone at that age and kinda of having to fend for yourself, let alone all the other shit. Right? Like that's crazy to try to comprehend like I mean, listen, I was a fuck up, but like I still went home for dinner every night with the with, you know, my mom, my stepdad, yeah, you know what I mean? Like I right. sat down and had like family dinners. Yeah. So I can't imagine like having to do that and and Yeah, I don't know what that is. I can only imagine, especially at such a, a young age, right? When and I just look at, at my kids, right? Like they're so inquisitive, they're figuring things out, they're learning about themselves, they're learning how to try to manage emotions. And they got a sweet life. Right. You know what I mean? Like, they, they have it sweet. Like, I was just at my son's playoff basketball game, mm -hmm. you know, that he plays every season that we, you know, pay for. And he goes to his private Christian school and, like, all this, all this shit that they have, you know what I mean? And it's hard enough trying to be a kid and figure out who you are and what you like and, you know, how to act and how to manage these emotions. So you throw all of that shit in the mix like, I'm not saying it's a, a no-brainer that, you know, you w steered towards drugs and alcohol, but, right. like, it makes perfect sense to me. Well, absolutely, because, um, I mean, just not, it, like, obviously it just started with, like, some air fresher, but then it got into bigger things, and the only reason I did that is because I didn't want to feel what I actually was feeling, right? Of course. And that's the disease of addiction. Right. We run from our feelings because we don't want to feel what actually is going on. Um, and that's exactly what I did, man. Uh, but being that young, um, and like, I don't know, maybe somebody's on here that has been through something like that. Um, but it was pretty severe, right? And what's going on behind closed doors when something like that is going on and the only thing, and now that I've like went to counseling and done a whole bunch of work in recovery this time, right? I found out that what I was doing was in complete survival mode. Absolutely. Right? Because... And what really scares me about the whole situation, about that whole situation, is I remember, you know, as I got a little bit older, you know, eight, nine, like I remember standing over this dude because he like he lived in the house with us, right? Mm. It's a close friend of the family or whatever the case may be. But I remember standing over this dude with a knife. Like if I just killed him right now, he could never do it again, right? But I never could bring myself to do it. God. But so that's the insanity part, like I was actually contemplating on killing this dude. Yeah. Um, so that's, I don't know if, when, like when you go through some kind of type of trauma like that for so long and consistent that you just, like I was talking to my therapist, he's like, bro, you just shut off. 
Like you completely go into survival mode. And that's a lot that happened later in life with relationships in my life, right? Mm. With, with women or with men or whatever the case may be. Like at a point in my life, I could be in, I still can kind of do it now, but I don't like that I have that kind of, of attribute to myself. Is like, if I want to shut you off, I can shut you off completely because I used to have to shut everything off for the time being of the th situation that was happening, mm. right? Mm. I couldn't actually be there in it while it was happening. It had to be somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. So I had to shut that off, and I can do that with people now. Like, hey, man, you know what? <laughs> You're done. Like, yeah. So, and it could be somebody that I really care about. Uh, let me ask you a question. How, you, how, how long did this go on for? For a long time. Um, so I, I imagine it, it went on to about, about I hit puberty, right? Jesus. And okay. it started probably when I was around four, that I, the earliest I could remember. Um, and then when did you finally, like, come clean and, like, tell people about it? Never until uh, I was 36. Whew. Yeah, I, I never told anybody until I was 36. And, you know, the the messed up part of the story is, and it, this, is a, this is the part of the story that hurts. Yeah. Right? Um and like I said, I could be transparent in the situation today. But like as I got older, man, you know, people that are like that, once you get a little bit older, they're not interested anymore because yeah. they're fucked up people, right? Yeah. They're crazy people. They're not sane. Um, so like I got too old and then like I became this great wrestler, man. Like I was winning state championships and I was playing basketball and like I was this great person that played sports. Um, and, you know, my brother's eight years younger than I am, mm -hmm. right? So uh, then he came into the world, you know, and he was that right age. Oh. And what's really messed up, and this is something that I have to carry with me on a daily basis that is hard and it makes me choke up a little bit talking about it, is that, um, you know, I let it happen to him and I never said anything. Well, and... And, and that's a rough thing to deal with. Yeah, you know no, I mean? no, no, no. I can't, I can't imagine. But, again, the psychological damage that happens... When that happens to somebody one time, right. the psychological damage, when you talk about years, because essentially you had went through it for more than half of your life yeah, up until absolutely. the point that it stopped. Right. And so it's you, you see those stories or, or you know, uh, they have like movies or like documentaries about it. And mm -hmm. like a lot of times, right, as somebody who didn't experience something like that, um, you find yourself like questioning like you know people that are like held captive mm -hmm. you're like why don't you just like attack him when he walks in the room and like haul ass but right. like when you're going through that psychological torture mm -hmm. like I, th I think you described it best like you just shut off yeah like, man everybody thinks they know what they're gonna do in a situation until it, they're in that situation exactly right and then it's a completely different story absolutely 110 percent. and you mm -hmm. i mean that's the best way i guess i can describe Ugh. it is to shut off but like so as that whole situation's going on for all them years right like i have other situations that are going on in my life like i remember that i, I think i said like i remember going to see my dad at like a rehab and he was getting out and all that stuff and then you know a couple weeks later we go see him and then he's all drunk and him and my mom get in a fight and like my mom like literally runs him over with the car right <laughs> And then looks in the back window and says, the motherfucker's still alive. And then backs up over him. Bro, I'm like nine, dude. I'm like, oh, my God, you just killed my dad. Like, I'm going through this traumatic event. Like, holy crap, what just happened? You just killed him. That's it. Yeah, it's over, it's right? Over. Um, so it was just, this the stuff that was going on in my life, man, was so crazy. Um, and then, like, the first time I actually got caught doing something, you know, me and my friends were like 11 um, we robbed a liquor store and, you know, beat the guy up pretty bad with like some broomsticks and tied him up and did all this crazy stuff and then stole his, cle stole his keys and uh, went on a high speed chase through three towns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we hit a 20 foot or we hit a brick wall, like a three foot brick wall, went off a 20 foot bridge. It was all over the news and all over f all, everything, everything there could be. It was all over. And that's like the first time I ever got in trouble and actually you know, paid a consequence for it. But um, even then I didn't care, right? <laughs> We're riding in the car. I'm like, 
let's go. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever happens isn't going to be worse than if I go home. I know that. Yeah. Like, let's ride. Yeah. You know, and uh, so basketball became a big part of my life, man. And, like, I told this in my story last Saturday when I was telling – um you know, I used to play basketball all the time as much as I possibly can, and the lights would go out at, like, 10, but I'd keep playing, you know, and they used to call me Crazy Andy because I'd be out there, like, talking to myself, like, get off me, get off me, like, out there shooting, talking to myself. And not that it's – it, it was one of the main factors of it was that I wanted to get better, yeah. right, but the real thing is that I didn't want to go home. You know what I mean? It's 10 o'clock at night. I'm seven or eight years old in the middle of the hood, yeah. right, and, like, all this stuff's going on around me, and I don't hear nothing. Yeah. All I just know is that if I stay here, I'm safe. Right? Dang. But really, in reality, I'm in the middle of a freaking hood that is crazy. Like, yeah. there's stuff going on. There's people selling drugs. There's people smoking crack. Like, people are getting shot. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's wild. But in that, I feel safe. And because cra- of crazy Andy's in yeah, <laughs> like core. Yeah, <laughs> I feel safe in that moment because I know if I go home, and I, it, then, you know, something else could happen. Yeah. Um. So that's that's pretty much my childhood, man. Um, you know, we have a big family. You know, my grandmother's got a lot of grandchildren, got a lot of cousins. Um, I mean, are is any of your family still up in Jersey? Yeah, I still have family up in Jersey. You can go and visit them. I haven't. The last time I went to New Jersey is when I went to my sister's funeral. Hey, shout out New Jersey! I'm going. Why? I don't know. I have Jersey? no idea. Wanda, yeah, Wanda's a. Uh, I'm going with Wanda. Wanda's got family up there still. Where? Couldn't tell you. Probably Newark. Yeah, I was going to say Patterson. that. Probably, yeah, probably Newark. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I think that's where she was from. So So I lived in Newark and uh, eventually East Brunswick. Yeah. So Love a Brunswick pool no, table. No, dude. It's no, deep it's, pockets. It's, it, it it's, is. It's so, bad, dude. So have you ever it's been to, have you ever been to like East Orange. A, a, a new place, right? And like you get off like an airplane or like you see the sign you know what i mean like now yeah. entering like north carolina and you're like oh shit this is nice when yeah. you get off the plane in jersey you're, you're like, like oh fuck <laughs> where did i go wrong where's it where's the, how do i get back yeah, like bad, no like it it almost and and this is no lie in a way yeah. it almost seems like walking into booking in jail no it, it's depressing dude it no. is it, it, it is it, it's it is does it smell People, I've heard that it smells. Well, I, that's Maybe more. That's, that's more if you go to like Philly. Yeah. Like you're going over to Philly Bridge. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's just it's it's a concrete jungle, dude. Bro, that's why they call it, that's why they call North the Brick City. Yeah. It's a concrete jungle. That's exactly what it is. It's so much. Like when I moved down here, I was like, they were like, yeah, this is the city of Sarasota. I was like, the city of Sarasota. This is out back as it gets. Yeah, <laughs> this is the like, country. Of yeah, Sarasota. super country. <laughs> yeah, right. And like my cousin that I was staying with when I, when I moved down here, literally lived right down the street from here on 10th Street, which is, you know, not a great neighborhood, right? Yeah. yeah. And they were talking about this is the hood. I said this ain't the hood. No, no I no, promise no. you, this isn't the hood, <laughs> yeah, right? No. And I thought it was like it was so, um, so much of a change. Like I remember being a kid, like. Like I said, seven, eight, nine years old, jumping on the train. Yeah. Gone. Going to wherever we wanted. You know what I mean? It was like a buck twenty round trip. Yeah. Beep, beep. Go back to New York City and back. Right? And like when I got down here, I'm like, there's no train. No. Nah. You can't get on the train. Public transportation compared to up there. I said it's not what? the same. This is wild. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I did look it up though. Flight club is like thirty minutes away from the hotel that we're gonna be staying at. The, in New York the, City. The the, the yeah. biggest the biggest thing that like I noticed was, for instance, down here you walk on the sidewalk and a complete stranger passes you. It is completely normal to nod your head at what's going on. You know what I mean? And keep it moving. Yeah. So growing up in that, and then when I went up there, because I went up there to open uh, a bonefish grill, right? Because yeah. I was a traveling trainer with them. I opened a store up there. And I was walking to work and nice Dude was walking by me. I said, hey, what's going on? He turned around. He said, fuck you. I said, what the fuck? Hey, New Brunswick ain't nothing to play with. No. Hey, I was just talking to a customer. New I was Brunswick's like, I'm going, to, I'm going to Jersey. He's from Jersey. And I, that's, I, he said, I'm from Jersey. I said, where's your accent? He said, I'm from Jersey. I said, oh, I'm going up there. He said, don't be nice. <laughs> he said, don't go up there nice. Yeah. Because yeah. ain't nobody nice up there. Nah, dude. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a different, different. It's it, like it's like going to a different country. Yeah. That's exactly what. That's the best way I can yeah. explain it. 
Yeah. But not that I ever been to another country, but when well, I came I'm down not, here, not, I don't even know if we're allowed. Yeah, I don't think to, I'm definitely not allowed. You but know what I mean? when I came down here, I literally thought like I was in another country, another world. Yeah, a complete another world. Yeah, like it, everything's so slowed down. I can't imagine trying to raise kids in an environment like that. Yeah, mm. man. Like it, trying to raise my kids in an environment like like I couldn't imagine. And Stress. everything's everything's yeah. like this. Bam! Everything's right next to each other, dude. Everything's on top of each other. All the houses, everything, dude. It's I think wild. if you were born there, though. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, know what I mean. Absolutely. It's like one of them things where if you're born, like you growing know up different. in Southside Chicago, like you know what I mean. You're born absolutely. like everybody knows you. Everybody knows yeah. your family. Yeah. Everybody knew your dad. Yeah. You know what I mean. So like. Yeah, man. Everybody knew my and everybody knew our family too, because my uncles have been around up there forever. Right. Like, um, it was yeah. So I wanna I wanna fast forward, and maybe not even fast forward. Like, when did you first realize that, like, getting high was a problem? Like, when did it change from like, okay, I'm just doing this to escape the day to day, or I'm just doing this because this is what me and the homies are doing to like, I want to escape this. Le- like, n- I have to get, I have to get high. Right. Yeah. So, I think more in my younger years, I think I was more addicted to um, the fast lifestyle of, you know, hanging out on the corner with drugs or whatever the case may be. Um, and like robbing and stealing, I think I was more addicted to that than I was anything. Mm. Like because the rush that I got from it was like bar none. Yeah. So, um, to actually, I mean, I I started smoking weed at a young age, and you know we were tripping. Like in school, we're taking acid and stuff like that. But when I really think that it became a problem is when I came down to Florida. How old um, were you? Uh, I moved back and forth. I was like 17 when I first came down here, but I went back up, came back down. So when I like completely moved down here, I was probably about 20. Um, and you know, when I came down here, my cousin was so deep into the drug game that it was like, uh, it was surreal, man. It was like living in a movie almost because he had so many drugs and, uh, so much cocaine that it was, it just became something. That's when I first knew that. It was like almost my first love, mm. right? When I first started doing cocaine because I knew that I couldn't stop. And I was like, I needed it all the time. That's when I knew that I had a drug problem. Um, but I didn't care. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it was like an endless supply of I didn't give a shit. And then I was still um, locked in that little boy's mind of I didn't give a shit about anything, right? So that combined with cocaine yeah, that's a <laughs> made bad. me 10 times more insane than I ever was. That's a, that's a perfect made me storm. way more insane. Like I didn't care about anything. It didn't matter. Yeah. Like my cousin would be like, hey man, this dude owes me five grand, go get it. What you want me to go do? Yeah. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go beat this dude with a baseball bat. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Like, what are they gonna do, put me in jail? <laughs> been there in my own mind, right? Yeah. Been there my whole life I've been there. I've been locked up in my mind my whole life. So um, that's when I really think that I knew that drugs were a problem in my life, but um, I didn't know nothing about recovery or nothing like that. So, so 20, when is the first time, how old were you when you gave recovery a chance for the first time? Um, I want to say I was introduced into recovery in the recovery pod when I was 32, I want to say, and... Then I, like, I was in there for a long time, and, uh, you know, I told that story, too, the old Patrick Lincoln story. Yeah, yeah. It was the wildest <laughs> shit ever. The first time I ever went to the Salvation Army, like, you know, I was in there for a super long time. I forget. I was in there for over, well over a year. I know that for sure, um, around 18 months or something like that. And, uh, you know, I, I finally got in the recovery pod because at first I was over in the goon, the Blue mm-hmm. Lagoon, and they wouldn't let me go to a recovery pod because I have, like, freaking eight and salt battery on Leo's because that's another thing I used to do. That's how crazy I was. Like, I'd call the cops on myself at my house and then fight them. <laughs> right? And then... And that's how I that's how I got so many assault battery on Leo's, dude. At, like, and it's wild to think that it's funny now, but that shit wasn't funny then. Like, I really did that, dude. Like, I'd call them and be like, "Bro, when they get here, I'm fighting all of them." <laughs> <laughs> like, 
It's sick, right? <laughs> yeah, no, nah, just it's nah, wild. Just a, but that's a visual. That's right. how many times. Like, so I had so many assault and battery on Leo. Is like, I was trying to get in the recovery pod because I heard about how they got nice beds over there, right? Yeah. And they got like nice TVs, and it's sweet over there. They got a basketball court and shit, yeah. like handball court. I'm like, I need to get over there. Yeah. Like, that's easy time. It's cupcake time. Yeah. So, yeah. um. Then like I just had to kept putting in requests and requests and then, like I had to go have like a meeting with the head person whatever they were the not the lieutenant the one above the lieutenant or whatever it is yeah 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 um and yeah. they finally let me go into the recovery pod and then I was in there for a super long time and you know when I first went in there I thought all of it was fake of course you know I thought these people get paid to come in here like this ain't real. Like, and then, like, after me and I'm like, yo, how much did they pay you? Like, <laughs> shit, I yeah. might do this when I get out. Yeah, Is yeah. it good money? Like, what are we talking about? A couple hundred or what? Like, you know what I mean? Like, shit, I'll come in here and tell them all kinds of shit, too. Yeah. Uh, but then I, like, found out that it was real, man. And, um, you know, I, I, I really jumped in and, um, you know, really gave recovery a try while I was in jail. Yeah. And, like, started working some steps. And, you know, Patrick Lincoln came in there, like, you know, it felt like nine times a week. You know what I mean? But I think it was like three times a week. Uh, I love Patrick, though. He did a lot for me. Um, and then, like, I ended up going to court, and I ended up beating my case. And they were like, yeah, you can get out today, Scott Free. Um, <laughs> and Patrick's like, no, just tell me you want to get a bet at the Sally. I said, <laughs> okay. Like, why would I want to do that? Like, I could walk out scot-free right now. He's like, nah, and he, like, really talked me into it. So I told him, like, nah, just going to wait for a bet at the Sally. Like, I think it's going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. You know? Well, like, freaking 38 <laughs> days go by, and I'm still in the county jail, dog. <laughs> and then he's coming in every day, right? And, you know, we all know Patrick. Like, he's a freaking karate Patrick. Bro, at this time, I'm probably, like, 265. Like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to beat this dude up when he comes in here this time. But I don't know if I really can. You yeah. know what I mean? He's got, <laughs> like that he's got the cleanest flat top i ever seen. Yeah. Him. And, uh... Cause yeah, I mean, so I'm like Patrick, I'm, bro. I'm doing dead time. Like I'm not even supposed to be here right now. Yeah, that time that 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 you do that you're not supposed to be oh, doing. Oh man, it's the worst. It feels like an it feels like a minute's like three days, bro. Oh for like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you're not any credit for any of that time you're no, just like hanging it's out dead you're dude. not even like a, in the system anymore no. you're just like a the yeah, guy you're on in the, the couch. system you're released like, yeah. so so what was the plan though let's say you didn't wait for a bed for this out like where were you gonna go back to your cousins probably well i mean yeah at that time i think my mom had a house somewhere you know and i got a bunch of other family i probably would have been full i probably would have got high i mean that's yeah. that's the truth of the matter right and that's why i said that that's when i first got introduced in a recovery and that's probably like the first real decision i ever made um from getting advice from somebody else mm. when, when you were telling your story you said that was the first time that your higher power taught you patience it was man and that and you know what i'm glad you brought that up because uh you know that's exactly what happened you know because i i had all this you know, I had a little bit of knowledge of recovery because i was working with a, a sponsor and i was working some steps and you know i felt like I had a great higher power relationship with my higher power. Um, and, you know, I didn't think that by no means that it was going to be that long that I was going to be sitting there waiting. Um, and like like Luke said, yeah, that's the first time that, um, you know, my higher power ever taught me patience because, you know, and the thing that comes to me now is be still and know that I'm God, right? And you're not. Mm. And he was definitely God in that situation because there was nothing I could do. Yeah. Like, I couldn't even walk out if I wanted to. And I wasn't even supposed to be there. Like, that was the most <laughs> wildest shit in the world, dude. I'm like, bro, I don't even have a bed in here anymore. Like, you guys put somebody else in my bed? Am I going to be sleeping on one of these fucking uh, aluminum tables? Like, what's going on here? The yeah. little uh, canoes, the yeah. little plastic yeah, yeah, canoes yeah. that like, they give you. Yeah, I, don't even, I didn't even have a canoe. Like, the canoe's been gone. That shit done floated down the fucking river. You know what I mean? The hell, bro. It <laughs> was in there on dead time. Though. But yes, man, like... The be still and know that I am God is exactly what happened because, like I was saying to you, Flip, is that's the first time I've ever actually took advice from anybody, mm -hmm. especially a man. Yeah. Right. Like because what happened to me, I'm not fuck, I'm not taking advice from no man. Like, yeah. what are you trying to get from me? Is my old my, is always my concept is any situation. Um, and then you know it was probably the best decision I ever made because mm -hmm. that's the first time I ever 
you know, actually put in some effort into getting clean. And I went to the Salvation Army and, you know, that place saved my life, man. Mm. It really did. It saved my life. And that's really where I got connected with my higher powers when I went to the Salvation Army. And, uh, you know, after I left there, man, is when I stayed clean for 46 months. Damn. 46 months. 40, not four years? Not four years. 46 months. <laughs> Honesty. I love it. Honesty. I yeah, love man. to see it. Um, so, so what, so, so what today, let's, yeah. let's get into today, okay. how it is now. What, what keeps you clean today, man? So, I mean, I, I, when I, somebody asks me that, my first thing is, you know, that, um, you know, and, and it says it in Narcotics Anonymous book, is that a recovery is based on our spiritual condition, mm. right? And I didn't write it. You know, they wrote it or, you know, Jimmy K or whoever wrote it. You know, it wasn't me. But um, I stand on that, man, because I know that if my spiritual connection is in good line, like everything else around me will work out to a certain extent, yeah. as we all know, right? <laughs> <laughs> For the past. Um, but no, but it does, though. Right. Because there's going to be some stuff that, you know, it's going to blindside you. And, um, you know, I don't know if you're not doing something right. The enemy ain't messing with you. Mm. Right. And that's what I was always told. And I could tell you this, boy, he's been messing with me lately a lot. Like this past year has been I can't even explain it in words. Like I can't even begin to explain it. But that's what keeps me clean today, man, is, uh, you know, I have a good support group. Like, you know, I have you guys, you know, um. You know, I go to a lot of meetings as well as many meetings as I can because, you know, we, we we work long hours and stuff. But, uh, you know, I put in some work, man. And I can, you know, I'll say this because, and I'm only saying this because it was so, I don't even know the word to use in my recovery this time. Because last, so I had 46 months and then I think I had like 18 months. And I never had any significant clean time if I didn't make it past 30 days, mm. right? I get like 15 days clean, go back out, oh, like nothing. Every time I got I'm a sure. 30, yeah. Every time I got a 30 day key tag, I've always had some significant clean time behind it, right? Um, so if anybody's listening and they're a newcomer, man, at least push the 30 days and give it a shot, mm. right? Um, so it just when I this time in recovery, man, is. Because I used to hear it all the time before. Like, you know, some people are sicker than others. You know all the cliches that they say and all the stuff that they say. And uh, sometimes it used to drive me nuts. And one of them that used to drive me nuts the most is because I was so gung-ho for Narcotics Anonymous. Like, this is what saved my life. And, you know, anything outside of this is, you know, not Bible. This is Bible right here, right? And, And that's what I always used to think. But then I used to hear people say all the time, sometimes people need outside help. Right. And when I actually stepped out of my comfort zone and went and got outside help, not by my own doing, but because of what happened, you know, when I got clean this time with, uh, you know, my kids getting taken away and all that, it was actually an obligation for me to do to get my kids back, you know, and that's the first time that I ever actually sat down with another man and opened up and was like, look, man, this is the situation. This is what happened. These are the things that I did. Like, how do I heal from this shit, Mm. right? And I think the best way how I healed in some of the situations that I did is just by talking about it Mm. with another person. And not only another person, but another man to actually trust another man in my life because I didn't trust my dad, Mm -hmm. right, because he was never around. I definitely didn't trust a dude that was doing all the crazy shit to me. Um, So I don't think I ever really trusted a man ever in my life. And I was like, bro, I had 46 months. I had 18 months. Like, what am I missing? in recovery this time bro and i just laid it out on the line and the dude's like one of my best friends now like i can call him on anything and he'll give me the 100 percent. this is what i think you should do unbiased you're a man you're gonna make your own decision and this is a perfect example so before i bought this ford f-250 <laughs> for a whole bunch of money cash right <laughs> i called him boy and i said Paul, should I buy this truck? And he's like, no, don't do it. He told you not to do it. He told me not to do it, right? And that's what's good about uh, good about having a relationship with this dude, man, is that he's not going to be biased in the situation. He's going to tell you, like, I think this is a bad decision, but do what you want. 
You know what yeah. I mean? Because he he actually taught me that this is how you grow in and and not only in recovery but in life mm. is to make decisions that are wrong. So, so, <laughs> so what'd you end up doing with what? You bought it? Oh yeah, I bought it. What happened? <sighs> well, what happened to the truck? Yeah, yeah. I still got it. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Is that the truck that I saw on Facebook that was on fire? <laughs> what's left of it? Is that the you one that blew up? Of it? Yeah, so. Um, Cook some steaks on it? Yeah, man. We were cooking marshmallows on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Me and Anthony over there were cooking marshmallows on it in the back. Nah, so um, it was a bad decision, right? Mm. But, like, to actually have somebody in my life that, um, you know, doesn't want anything from me. But all want all he ever wanted to do was help me was like it was it blew my mind. And after, you know, I had a case plan to be able to get my kids back. And after that case plan was over, like I had to start paying money to go see this dude. Mm-hmm. And when he told me how much it was, I was like, you could have told me it was double that and out of game. Mm. Right. Because that's how important that part of my life had become. And I went and I seen him for about three years, two times a week for three years. Right. And um, I think that's really what's different for me in recovery this time, man, is that I actually seeked outside help um, because that's what the program told me to do, mm. right? Because sometimes people need outside help. I love that. I love that. You know, it's a, a common theme that I've seen. It's similar in my story and Luke's story in your story, even Ant's story, right? Like we have – fallen in our own ways so many times just continue to run into that wall right Right. and like no this time's gonna be different and then next thing you know we're face first in the wall again and we got to the point where another cliche got sick and tired of being sick and tired and was willing to do whatever it took to try and figure out this puzzle that's how i explain it you know what i mean like i am a puzzle and i have no idea how these pieces were supposed to go together right because when i was trying to put it together on my own didn't work a, a absolute nightmare <laughs> they right were ups- the pieces were upside down and yeah. so and so that, that's why when they said you know uh i had a sponsor who told me to journal i want you to journal every day and like just how you're feeling right journal. i was like who, i was who journals i was willing i was willing to do whatever Absolutely. it took he told me to uh because i was in the sally he was like right. take advantage of any type of one-on-one counseling you can get and i did it you know what i mean any type anytime we had a teacher come in you know uh when we went to class and they would like one day a week have like you could stay after put your name on the list and you know we'll have a one-on-one like i was willing to do whatever the hell it took mm-hmm. any suggestion um to try and figure this thing out, you know what I mean? And here we are, you're coming up on the most clean time you've ever had. I have the most clean time I've ever had, most oh, clean dude. time. And then Ant's right behind us, because if not, you guys yeah. can never see Ant again, because yeah. we're fucking him up. Yeah, right. <laughs> bad. Jumping, yeah. Yeah. yeah, bad. That's it. Shave um, his beard off of his so, face. <laughs> and, and I love that you, you, you uh, saw outside help you know what i mean because i'm a huge advocate of that because i always had this stigma around like therapy and counseling and stuff like that like no that's for crazy people right and it wasn't until i came to terms with hey guess what bub you're crazy (laughs) yeah you know what i mean you're one you're and 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 i'm okay with that (laughs) i'm okay with that i own that you know what i mean and it was a huge huge just one of those eye-opening things and the coolest thing about it is like i'm expecting this professional that I'm going to tell them, here's my life story, here's where I went wrong, this is my problem, and they're going to give me an instruction guide on how to fix it, and that's not it. Like, you go and you talk, and they just listen, and they'll ask a question here or there, Mm -hmm. and you figure it out on your own. You know what I mean? There were so many times when I would be talking, and in the middle of what I'm saying, you know, answering a question that they had, it's that aha moment. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, okay. You just, you just answered your own question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the the, the beauty in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just, I'm such a huge advocate of that. So that's super, super cool. You know, um, go ahead. Hey, Ant, can you go to the uh, fire pit and pull up um, Andy's truck, the <laughs> F-250 real quick? All right. So. <laughs> show everybody. So, so Luke really wants me to talk about this F-250 truck. All right. So, I mean. So the last, uh, I'll tell you this, the last year of my life has been probably one of the hardest years that I've ever had to actually go through 
um, sound mind. Mm. 2023 right? was a rough year for you. Yeah, man. It was a rough year for me. Um, you know, through the whole thing, like, I mean, it's not a big secret. I'm going through a divorce. Uh, you know, that's never easy. That's never easy. You know, it's the mother of my children. You know, even to this day, I still have, you know, love for her. Um, but, you know, we were going to two separate ways, right? And I'm not going to bash anybody because that's just not who I am. But, you know, she was making choices and I were making choices, and I just felt like our choices weren't meeting in the middle, mm. right? Um, so that is a struggle within itself because, like, my oldest daughter was just in here uh, a few minutes ago, and, you know, something I always told myself was when I had her that me and her mom were going to be together forever because I never wanted her not to have her mom and her dad in the same house, right? And that's something that happened, and it, like, tore me apart that she couldn't have that. And then, like I was talking about earlier with the whole, you know, how could my dad pick drugs and alcohol over their children? Well, I'll give you a little background story on what happened to me. I did the same thing when it came to my 18-year-old daughter, right? When she was about five, man, like, I was either incarcerated or in rehab or just all the way fucked up on the streets. Like, she's 18 probably for 13 years of her life. Mm. Like, just abstinent. Um, and the guilt from that is what made me keep using. Like, I can't believe that I did it. The same thing my dad did. How could I do the same thing to her that my dad did to me? Mm. And uh, that's why I came to realize how powerful the disease of addiction is. Um, so That shit hit. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. it that's, was just, that's my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was crazy, man. It was crazy yeah. to me that I actually allowed that to happen. And then, you know, so going through this divorce and, you know, I had that time clean coming out of the Sally, that, that four years I had clean. <laughs> a shy, just a little bit shy. Just a little shy. Um, I ended up having my son, mm. right, and, uh, and my daughter, my youngest daughter and my oldest son. Um, and then I relapsed after that 46 months being clean, man, and when I tell you I drugged them through the mud, bro, like I drug them through the mud. Like I did some crazy stuff, bringing them on drug deals, you know what I mean? Like, they're in the car and I'm stealing shit. Like, just wild, crazy shit that they should have never been a part of. And to know that I did that was, like, completely obliviating to me when I got clean and, like, know that I put them through that stuff. But so as me and my wife are separating, making different choices in life, I know that that's one of the choices I can never make ever again, right? Um, whether what happened in 2023... <laughs> was so crazy, you know, with the whole situation, everything was insanity um, in 2023. Like, a bunch of money came up missing, you know. Um, here's the thing. Here's <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. Let me just. Yeah, yeah. So here's the Let thing. Let me hear it. Like, what you got? It wouldn't even have. I may not have even had a, a dog Talking in the, the mic. race. Talking to Mike. I might not even had a dog in the race, yeah. but you went and moved in directly next door to me. All right? <laughs> So I'm seeing the yes, whole thing absolutely. up close and personal with my bowl of popcorn watching everything play out. And when I say Andy has the worst luck in the world. In the world. I'll tell you right now, Andy just bought a brand new truck after that truck and flip. I was just going on the way to a basketball game that I told you about, the playoff basketball game. Yeah. I am driving to <laughs> Core SRQ, which is by Sarasota uh, Square. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's that's Luke's van with the flashers on. Yeah. Why is Luke's van with the flashers Absolutely. on? Absolutely. And I call him. I say, yo, you need help? Like, I got to drop my son off. But if you need, he's like, nah, just drop in or jump in uh, Andy's truck. And yeah. I said, what? Did, he got another truck? He's like, yeah, brand new one. Brand yeah. new. Yeah. Andy I, called right me. He said, box. I need your help. I pulled up. I seen a cop standing next to me. I said, oh, Lord, Andy's <laughs> fighting the police again. <laughs> God bless. Here we go. And he done. Uh, he couldn't. He couldn't handle himself anymore. He said, no. "I'm gonna call the cops." Pulled over right on the side of the road to throw hands with him. Damn. Yeah. Whole truck, brand new truck. You know, Andy's one of those uh, people in recovery that like. I don't know if I could really like bring some problems to right, and I say that because <laughs> not that he wouldn't listen and give me some right. sound advice, 
but like right is put things into perspective real quick it's one of them things you're going to take your problems and you're going to run <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah so that's something that somebody first told me when i like first got around a recovery too is like the reason why they went to meetings is so they could hear everybody else's problem because if you go into a meeting with like 50 people in it and everybody puts their problems in you'll be the one grabbing yours back like i don't want there yeah, yeah. right so I, yeah. I i could put that in perspective what you're saying um but yeah man the last just like the last few months was just outrageous so i i, I had a a dodge ram that um you know i had for a while like it it, it did its purpose but uh yeah it blew up yeah. Like it blew up, the, yeah. boat, the motor blew up. Yeah. So then I spent like I don't know twenty eight hundred dollars rebuilding the motor or something, and then like three days later, it caught fire. Nah, I got shot. Oh, okay. Right? And I'm not really gonna go into too many details, but the truck got shot. Yeah, show sure enough. You know, a whole bunch of other stuff happened, but um, anyway, so that truck went to shit. Yeah. Right, and then I bought this new truck, mm. the the Ford. Yep. The fire truck. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was red. Truck. It was a red fire truck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> um, and then like, so I bought it for like, I forget, man. I bought it for like twenty. Sunny was there when yeah. I bought it. Um. Thanks, Bill. About twenty eight. If you're big watching, ones. if you're watching, Bill, appreciate you. <laughs> um. So I'm there, right? And. You know, I've never had anything in my life. Yeah. Like, I came from the slums. I never had money or never had anything like this. And then, you know, I got a part of this company that, you know, showed me how to make a lot of money and became really good at it and became actually a part of the company, right? So I had a little bit of money, and uh, I didn't want – they wanted $27,500 for it. And um, I said, bro, I'm, I, I got to go outside. <laughs> I feel sick. I feel like I'm gonna puke. <laughs> like I've never spent that much money yeah. in my life at one time yeah. ever. Um, and so I call Bill. <laughs> like, ah, just do it. <laughs> okay, no problem. Then I call Paul, <laughs> my therapist. He's like, "Don't fucking do it. Don't yeah. do it." Right. <laughs> anyway, I end up buying this truck. Um, had it for a couple months, and then uh, you know somehow, some way. Not really sure, but sugar got put in my tank, and um, it was a, a, a 2015 250 Super Duty. Mm-hmm. So it was a diesel. It was right? a nice so, truck. So if something goes into one of those um, fuel systems, it like completely messes up the whole thing. So it was like eight or nine grand or something to get it fixed, and uh, yeah, so I got it fixed. It was running great. Got it deleted. It was like almost like a race car. Like, when I picked it up, Sonny drove me to go pick it up. And I'm like, how much faster is this thing now that it's deleted? He was like, bro, it'll put, you know, it'll give Sonny's car a run for its money. The BMW. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. really? So I get in this thing. This thing's flying, dude. I'm loving it. And then, uh, you know, about like five days, maybe, after that, <laughs> I pull up to my shop and uh, it won't start. So I jump it with Anthony's truck you know it was Anthony's fault <laughs> I just now thought about that I jumped it with your truck you know what I mean yeah. that's what made it blew up yeah two, hey two sickies don't make a well nah. you know what I so mean? I go inside the shop the truck's running everything's cool you know what I mean in the shop for like five minutes and I come uh I'm come walking down the hallway at our shop and some dude comes running in there it's like bro your truck's on fire like, I go out there, this whole motherfucking thing's golfed in flames. Jesus. I'm like, oh, man. So, like, I think Anthony was one of them. You know, Eric, Jay yeah. was one of them. He's yeah. trying to – they're all trying to put it out with fire extinguishers and shit. And it's a, it's not going out, bro. Like, it's yeah. just not happening. With these Burn fire. through your hood. Yeah. They're, it's not going out. So, um, they uh, – like, you got to call a fire department. Right? Yeah. So, call the fire department. Like, everybody – cops and everything show up. This thing's just on fire, dude. They put it out, um, and I'm like, cool, man. All right. You know, I want to cry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, but everybody's out there watching, so I can't really cry. You know what I mean? But I wanted to. I'll give you – I think I did a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I think I might have, right? Of course. Just paid all this money for this car, and it just paid for the fuel system to get fixed. Like, it was a disaster. And I'm like, whatever. All right. So after I got composed with myself, I'm like, I got insurance on this motherfucker, right? Yeah. Full cuff. (sighs) 
we're good. You know, I deal with full cup insurance all the time yeah. in the business that I'm in. You know what I mean? So this is like January 24th. Um, so I call the insurance company. I'm like, look, man, my truck just got on fire. I know I got full coverage. Like, I need you guys to pay for this thing because I paid cash for it. Yeah. Cash money. They're like, uh, yeah, your wife called on the 18th and took you off the insurance. You're not covered. <laughs> Bro, almost fucking lost it, dude. So, like I said in the beginning of this story, I still got the truck. It's just not running. Yeah, I mean, to be expected. Yeah. So, when I say that you have the worst luck in the yeah. world, yeah. let me preface that by saying that... With all the shit that you've been through, who, right? And that even that's just year, touching that's on just a little a couple bit of things. It. I know all the stuff that you've been yeah. through because I've seen it firsthand, right? And I've been involved in some of it. Oh, you've been pretty, involved in all of it pretty closely, <laughs> yeah. And it has been truly an inspiration for somebody to stay clean through all of that shit because it's stuff that I I. I'm looking at it from an outsider's perspective saying, right. I don't know if I could stay clean through some of that shit. Yeah, man. And I've been through some tough shit and stayed clean, but like just the series of unfortunate events that have taken place and you've managed to stay clean and keep a level head and, and keep your priorities in check of being a father and you know, the best dad that you can be and being a business owner and being responsible for people at work Right. And keeping your composure as truly an inspiration. That's what I love about the program the most, right? Because we look at what, like I look at what you've been through, and I feel the same way, right? And and we all kind of have those situations and those circumstances and those stories. I mean, because that's life, right? Like life deals you some fucked up hands sometimes right oh, yeah. and that's and that's just the way it is right i've never Absolutely. quite seen a, a hand like andy's but we all get we all get <laughs> shit we all get shit thrown our way right Two six off suit and um <laughs> like it's, it's all in it's such a battle and this is what like i explain i try to explain to people right and this is like one of the main reasons that like i go to the gym is for my mental health i can't when i've had a rough day or a rough week i can't go home and crack a beer no right. you know what i mean mm -hmm. i can't i can't go home and smoke a joint right like you, we a crack joint we have to just sit in our shit and yeah. figure out a healthy way to digest it and move forward and that's just what it is yeah and um I mean, like I said, the, the first time I met you was 2012. Yep. You know what I mean? And so Absolutely. both of us, I mean, we didn't stay clean from the first time that we met. You know what I mean? Um, but it's just been one of those things that, like, it's been so cool to see, man. It's been so cool to see the journey. It's been so cool to see, like, where you are now. You know what I mean? Because I remember when I first met you, you was doing manual labor. Oh, yeah. Hard shit. Doing block work. Yep. And I remember Slamming he would <laughs> he would he would show up to a meeting just covered dirty just covered in dirt you know what I mean yeah. um to see that to see where you get to be in a position now financially right. where your 18 year old daughter can come up and you know what I mean like you can bless her so she can have a safe trip and stuff like that that like, was really dope that's she was so excited yeah she was excited like and it's you just know super it was cool. like um and so. I'm not so it's a great gift of recovery to be able to do things like that yeah. right and so so i can tell you this <laughs> i don't know that I, I my dad ain't never bought me shit yeah right the only thing my mom's ever bought me i think was like food you know what i mean yeah. anything else i ever got in life i remember like going into um going into high school and uh i was like mom i need a pair of jordans like everybody's got jordan I'm wearing Jimmy shoes yeah. from freaking three years ago. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what are we doing here? There's holes got, in them. Got some Asics on. She said, I got three other kids to feed. I ain't buying you no fucking Jordans. That's real. She said, I know where you can go get some. I said, where? She said, I know a dude that owns a company. They pick up. So if you go up north, like, because there's not, like, mountains and shit down here. But if you go up north on the side of the roads, they got, like, these crates with big fucking boulders in them and shit to, like, make roads. And 
I was 12 and she said, you can go work with him for the summer. Right. And I think I was making like $20 a week or something. Mm. I don't know, 25. Mm. Right. And save your money and buy your own Jordans. So every day she dropped me off there and I shit you not, me and my cousin Jason used to pick up these big ass boulders and put them in these container like wire lath things. And that's how I bought my first pair of Jordans. Right. And that's probably the best thing that she ever taught me was work ethic. Mm. Like I ain't got it. You got to go get it. And, um, you know, so to be able to do like my daughter has a, um, you know, she turned 18 and she's got a 2018 Nissan Maxima. And I, me and her mother got it for her, right? But it was like 18 grand. And we bought it cash because I didn't want to set her up for failure with a payment because she's 18, right? Um, And to mess all her credit up and all that stuff, to be able to, to be able to do that was probably like one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life. Hell yeah. To see her on her 18th birthday. I got a video. I'll show you guys one of it one day, but we went to uh, the Hibachi, right? And then... You know, she was, ah, she, and she's a brat, dude. She's a brat. She's going to watch this one. She's a brat. Um, bougie as hell. Yeah. I'm like, I want a car. I want a car. I'm like, who do you think I am? <laughs> like, I'm not buying you a fucking car, dude. Like, yeah, who do you think I not am? happening. Bill Camp. <laughs> yeah, you think my name's William Camp? Like, <laughs> the hell you think I got running? So, um, like, we walk outside of the bocce. Like, I give her some gift card, mm-hmm. like 500 bucks on it or something, whatever. And uh, as we're all walking out hibachi, I set the alarm off on the car. Oh, we and it's got a big red bow on it, and it's white with dark tinted windows. It's a nice car, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then she just like freaked out. It was like That's probably so one of the dope. best feelings I've ever had in my life. That's so dope. But the only reason I was able to do that is because I stayed clean. Yeah, mm. you know what I mean. That's that's one of the only reasons. And you know, um, Narcotics Anonymous helped me do that, man. Um, but to be in the position that I'm in now is a lot different than than uh than throwing block around. I can tell you that. Yeah. So it's it's. <laughs> It's super cool, man. It's uh, inspiring. I mean, not only the shit that you've been through the past, you know, 12 months, but to hear that other side of your story and the fact that you're here, you know what I mean, choosing to do the next right thing and stay clean. Um, it's inspiring, man. That's dope. That's dope. Um, I keep trying to push through, man. I that's can all you can that. do. That's it. And so going through all the stuff I went through and, like, I mean, right now, I, I'll be even, you know, I'll be transparent about this. Like, I, I haven't seen my kids in a while because of the situation mm-hmm. that I'm going through. That's hard, bro. Yeah. That's a really hard situation to be in because, you know, um, I got clean because I wanted to have my kids in my life, right? And to not have them in my life now and have to stay clean through that, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Like, I don't usually I don't think about getting high like it doesn't cross my mind now in these days because I put a few days in front of me to where, you know, I don't need to get dope anymore. But um, it's not an easy situation to be in with all the other stuff that's going on in my life to uh, to be away from my kids is a hard situation for me. Yeah, it really is. So, yeah, yeah, man, I've been through a lot, but I can just say that, uh, you know, for anybody listening like, you can go through anything in recovery and stay clean, mm. right? Because I remember being in recovery last time, like, I had that 46 months, and then I had 18 months. But when I was in that 18-month recovery run that I had, you know, one of my reservations was always, if my mom dies, I'm going to get high, right? And it ended up happening. Mm. Like, she died of cancer, and, uh, you know, I remember stealing her morphine mm. when she was, like, laying on her deathbed. And, but the reason I did it, because I wanted to get high. That's why I did it. You know, because there was a long time when she was really sick that I stayed clean and helped her go to the bathroom and do all this other stuff, took her on walks and all that other stuff. But I had a reservation in my mind that one day I'm going to get high again. Today in my recovery, I don't have a reservation like that. Like, I, there's no reservation to get high. Um, because I know getting high solves absolutely nothing in my life. Right. All it does is create chaos, bro. And I already got enough of that clean. Like, I don't need to add any more chaos to my life. And that's all that drugs and alcohol does for me is adds a whole bunch of chaos to my life. And it's just something I don't need in my life right now. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Well, so, no, that's God bless. No. All right. So.
I can't with y'all too. Just Sometimes, just, bro, just close your eyes. Dog. Just close your we eyes. We gotta be like in the story. Come yeah. So, on. so here's the thing, right? And it, it, we're we're taking this back, okay? You, Luke, and I are in a halfway house, right? <laughs> okay. We got about thirty six days clean between the three of us. All okay. three of us in one room. Okay. <laughs> one room. And um, we're walking from a meeting back to the halfway house, right? And, uh, you know, we're talking and we're just, we're, we're really trying to do this thing. Yeah. And uh, a car flies by us, right? And we see police sirens. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. out of this car, there's just money flying. $100 wow. bills. Cash. $100 cash. bills. Hey, cash okay? is king, boy. Cash Meanwhile, is king. us three are working landscaping. Okay, so you know Hate we it. don't got money like Hate that. It. Hate my life. And the cops aren't worried about the money. They're trying to catch the fleeing suspect, yeah. right? And so Luke's like, grab the money. Yeah. So we're just scooping up money. And it seems like it doesn't make sense as to how there is so much money, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's so much money. <laughs> like it just doesn't – like how did this much even fly out of the car, right? Yeah. And we're just picking up all this money, right? And so we got pockets loaded, we got handfuls, and we run back to the halfway house. Now, us three are sharing a room, right? Mm. And we put all the money on the bed, yeah. and we're, like, counting it. And we're like, dude, like, we could go get a place. Like, we don't got to be in this halfway. Oh, we, yeah. You know what I mean? We're like, we could get high, but we're like, we're not even thinking about getting high. You no, know what I mean? No. We're trying to come up in the world. Yeah, that's, that's a, a beautiful Lamborg thing. Right? Lamborghini. Right? I need a and, Lambo. And... You know, we're, we have all these ideas. We were thinking about starting a business. We were thinking about buying some clothes. Like, we have no idea what we're going to do with this, right? Yeah. And then you have the idea of, listen, there's about $30,000 here. Like, wow. if, we get, if we get a whip, like, we don't have to walk nowhere. Like, we can, you know, we'll be straight. Yeah, you know, and and we come to terms with this, and we're like, you know what, this is, this is the play. Three kings, right? Three kings this, of the world. This is the play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we talked about, maybe getting three like hoopties. Yeah. You know what I mean? We'll just go three ways on one nice one. Yeah, one yeah. Toyota Camry. Yeah, you know what I mean? So we go. We got some 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 people, you know, in in meetings. Everybody knows somebody, of right? Course. So we get hooked everybody up, and and we go, and and we're looking at these uh, three little Honda Civics, and we're like, <laughs> you know. Fast and Furious thinking, <laughs> right? Boy. Like we Family. take them on a test Civic. drive. Family. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, the the sales dude was like, yo, like, I got something y'all might really like, right? And we're like, all right, what is it? And he takes us around back, and he's like, I got this beautiful fire red Ford Super Duty <laughs> truck <laughs> for $28,000. <laughs> you ready? One, two, three, go. There it is. There it is. Listen, th thank you so much for, for coming on the pod. Thank you for sharing yeah, open and honestly about your experience, strength, and hope. Um, you know, it, it truly does make a difference, and it's uh, inspiring. And I'm um, glad you're here, bro. I think, I think a lot appreciate of people it, are going to be yeah. inspired by that story. I appreciate y'all having me, for sure. Yeah. Make sure you uh, yeah, may, uh, like, share, subscribe. Yeah, and the, with the yep. – hit that uh, – you know what I'm saying? Yep. With the bell yeah. notification. Do yeah. the bell notification. Yeah. yeah. Get in there. Yeah. Get in the comment section. Make, you know what I'm saying? Just like make sweet. Make yeah. sweet with the peeps in yeah. the comment section because like, you know what I mean? Like there's good peeps. So Luke and I have had a conversation prior to recording this and like our, our merch is all messed up. Um, yeah, we, the, we ran out of V-neck. Somebody was asking for a V-neck. You know what I mean? I got on the phone with the CEO at Fourth Wall. I was like, "Hey, yo, yeah, yo, what's up with the, you know what I'm saying? That and them Agua Velvas, uh. right?" <laughs> and he was like, "My guy, discontinued." So those were discins. Yep. Um, I don't know. We I deleted our entire. Uh, I can't. So listen, you want to talk about some bad luck? Yeah, I mean, flip let's talk. deleted. Our entire portfolio. He deleted everything. Our whole catalog. Now let's wow. let's 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 back this up a yeah, little bit. All of our past episodes. Let's let's back all this up. Let's, let's back all this up. the episodes. So every 
Well, let's back this up a little bit. So what happened was our where we edit only has so much storage on it, right? Yeah. And so this is episode 42. 42? Yeah. Yeah. And so I bought an external drive, two terabyte drive, right? Naturally. The story's going great so yeah. far because this is, I mean, this was the smartest thing that Flip has ever, Yeah. you know what I mean? This is, yeah. this is like, I'm with it. Yeah. hundred percent. We love it. I need it. Let's and go. And so I spent two entire days because it doesn't just transfer quickly. Like yeah. it takes, each folder has... Uh, the raw footage, it has the completed version, it has our shorts, it has the thumbnail picture. <laughs> like, it's it, it each folder, and this is episode 42, so Everything. you can imagine it's a lot of stuff, Everything. right? So the first 38 folders I get on this drive, right? And I'm like, all right, cool, now I can delete it all, free up the space, space. right? What I didn't realize I was doing... He made some space. What I didn't realize I was doing was I was only copying it. I wasn't actually moving it. So I was just making a copy on the drive. So if you make a copy, but you delete the original, you no longer have a copy. It's like killing the original vampire. You know, you know what, what I mean? mean? Like, And um, so I did that because some people were asking, like, where can we stream it? And we only have up to episode 17 on the streaming platforms because it's us. Because it's us and we don't know what we're, we're doing. doing. You know what I mean? Um, and so we're winging it. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to figure everything yeah. out. But HGP, listen, burn the ships. We we love you guys. We appreciate the support. Uh, if you want a live look in, you can hang out with the patrons. They've been riding with us um, since God knows how long. Uh, but yeah, we appreciate you. You gonna tell them how we uh, appreciate all the support? How we end the app? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, you got to slide off your chair. Like this. <laughs> <laughs>